Thought Creators, the podcast for financial experts brought to you by FAB. Welcome back to Thought Creators, the podcast that takes a look at the issues impacting the world of finance and takes a look at them through a very human lens. Brought to you, of course, by one of the leading banks in the region, First Abu Dhabi Bank. Now, my guest today is a man with the big picture, leading as he does FAB's international business. He is Clarence Singham, Head of International Business Group with FAB. Clarence, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Scott. It's great to be here today. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm so excited to get into this conversation because you've got a pretty big role. So there's lots of different things we can talk about. But we always start the podcast with just having a look at the headlines. Um, It's almost an easy place to start with you, but a massive question. Uh, If we look at the headlines, almost on a daily basis, we're talking about the economic headwinds. You know, we've seen what's happening with the, the challenges in the banking sector in the US, in the UK, in Europe. Um, we're looking at challenges, whether it be from interest rates and inflation. We've got geopolitical tensions. I'm going to ask you a big question. Clarence, what's going on? But also, what does it mean for this part of the world? What does it mean for this region? You know, when we see the banking industry perhaps struggling in different parts of the world, what's the prognosis here? And those economic headwinds we were talking about, if we look at it from the lens of where we sit today in the UAE and within the Middle East region, um, what does this all mean? Firstly, I, I think the what we're facing today with the inflationary pressures was actually set up way back in the 2008 crisis, right? The central banks came in to, to the rescue and the system became flush with liquidity, right? And that was okay. And that was good. And we expected a low interest rate environment to keep going on. However, with COVID and the disruption of supply chains and then the post-COVID recovery, um, especially with the US, uh, the American Recovery Act, that really brought lots of extra liquidity into the system. Uh, It resulted in a sudden um, shooting up of demand and therefore a disruption of supply chains, right? And that brought in the inflationary pressures. And that has become a real challenge. And right now, I don't think central banks have fully gotten their head around how to bring inflation down without kind of triggering uh, a recession. And this has resulted in therefore now them having to balance between two things. One is managing inflation down via interest rates. But on the other hand, with increasing interest rates and the flush liquidity in the system, how do you then ensure financial stability? And we saw what happened with with the U.S. banks. So that is one thing that's going on here. The second thing that's going on then is the geopolitical tensions we are facing today. That has resulted in some interesting outcomes. Number one, uh, it's resulted in, in kind of an oil and gas boom, right, which is benefiting this region. Number two, it's changing the supply chains for oil and gas. For example, I think more and more um, Russian gas and oil will go to the east and this region will become a much more um, stronger supplier of of oil and gas to the west. In fact, we're expecting that the uh, doubling of oil and gas supplies to the west. The third thing that's also happening is that with the emergence of a multipolar world, you're finding that this region is becoming more consolidated, more interconnected, and I think that's good for this region. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. One of the words um, you used, which is the dreaded R word, uh, recession and the the possibility of recessions. Um, uh, At the beginning of the year, um, Hannah Al Rostamani from FAB was talking about how she thought this region was actually going to fare much better. And back then we weren't even talking about avoiding technical recessions or soft landings, which we seem to have progressed a little bit as the year has gone on. We may or may, you know, the US and the UK may or may not go into recessions. Uh, but her forecast was that actually this part of the world, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, the Middle East, would actually fare better and part, certainly parts of this region could see growth. I'm just wondering what your helicopter view of that is. Again, if we look at those economic headwinds, how are we doing in this part of the world? I agree. I mean, the expectation is that in the next five years, the Gulf will make close to $3.5 trillion, uh, in, in revenues. Okay. You know? so, so that gives That's a healthy number. Yeah, that gives us a real great buffer in order for the the economies here to begin to do its diversification. We've been wanting to diversify away from fossil fuels for a long time. 
Now this gives us an opportunity and the the head space to be able to do this. For example, in Saudi, what's going on in Saudi, what's going on in in the UAE, it's it's amazing. I think that you will see a transformation of this region in the next four to five years. I mean, that's something that your chief uh, sustainability officer Sharjah was talking about about this road to the energy transition, and it's a transition. It's not a, you know, there's no way you can turn it off. So does that economic prosperity or the potential of that economic prosperity help this region pay for that transition yes, it gives it, it the time totally yes it does it gives us the the budget surpluses that we will need to be able to fund those projects because those are going to take some time and they're fairly long gestation periods so if i circle back to another what well, i thought was absolutely fascinating you talk about this region kind of coming up um you know we've just seen very recently in headlines the leadership here has just been you know strengthened once again you know so so just to give that message of stability to the world we have new leadership at the very highest level Um, we can see that the leadership of this country is very strong very stable what impact does that have in terms of that economic prosperity? How attractive is that to global markets when they look at this region and go, stability? How important is that, given the volatility we see elsewhere in the world? I, I think it's fundamental. You know, I mean, I have been in the Middle East for a year and a half now, and it's amazing right now. It's just like, you know, this is probably one of the most stable places on the globe today. And stability is just fundamental because financial markets and economic growth just completely depend on that. You know, investors just love financial stability and we're beginning to see the flows coming into this region. I think it's absolutely fundamental. What are the what are the key elements of that then for you, from your perspective? When, when, when you talk to the investment, you talk about the, you know, you, you, you look at 18 different countries. Um, why is the money coming here? Is it a flight to safety? Yeah, it's definitely a flight to safety. I think firstly, it's about stable leadership. We now have le- leadership that is stable, that is that is uh, long-sighted and not just short-sighted. I think that's one very, very important thing. I think the industrial and economic policies that are being put in place are very, very sensible. And again, that gives a sense of a growth trajectory for this region. And those are things that I think are attracting funds into this country. Now, I was doing a little bit of research when we were talking off camera. Um, I think first I've had a big bank last year was voted one of the safest banks in the world. Is it Global Finance? Do yes, Global Finance. Yeah. We are the only Middle Eastern bank in the top 25 safest banks in the world, and we are number 14. That is an amazing feat, I think. What are the, you know, what are the ingredients of that? Because, I mean, that's not something you achieve overnight, of course, as well. So if we, you know, we always talk about the fundamentals, you know, of the macro economy and all that sort of thing. What have been the fundamentals for FAB to actually be one, the, you know, one of the safest banks in the world? I mean, it's just leadership, right? You think about it. We've had very stable leadership over the, the, the decades that have been, been in existence. Even our current CEO has been in the bank for a very long time. You know, it's not someone coming from the outside trying to change everything, but someone who's in the bank, who knows the culture, who knows the systems, but yet who's visionary enough to make the necessary big bull moves. I think that leadership is very, very fundamental. FAB has always been a very prudent bank. We've always, for example, kept to ensure that our cost to income ratios are low. We have a very strong capital base. Um, I haven't given you the opportunity to tell the audience about yourself yet. Um, just give me uh, a little bit of a, an overview of your backstory, if you would like, you know, your journey to, to FAB or journey within FAB. What does the day-to-day job of a head of International Banking Group entail? Um, and what's exciting you? you know, what's in the, the journey ahead? So I, I joined the bank eight years ago, and for most of those period, I was uh, head of Asia. Then about two years ago, they decided to create this role called the head of international, asked me whether I wanted to take it on. And I said, oh, okay, this is going to be interesting, right? Because I've never actually really done the Middle East in any depth, right? I've done Asia, I've done Europe, Americas, but not so much the Middle East. So that seemed like a really interesting growth opportunity. So we're in Brazil, D.C., um, London, Geneva, Paris. In this region, we're in Egypt, um, Saudi, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, and we're going to be opening up in Iraq, which is going to be really, really wow. exciting. And in Asia, we are in Mumbai, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, mainland China, and Korea. That's quite a footprint. Yes, it's, it's amazing. We opened up in China in March of last year. And I love the job, you know, because for me, it's about how do we bring our international franchise into one integrated ecosystem. 
we, we are the Middle East is one of the largest international footprints, right? And we have the opportunity to become a really strong international bank that's based in the Middle East. The question is, how do we integrate them into one ecosystem? How do we tap the synergies that we have between the different countries so that we tap into the flows that is increasingly happening between these locations? I was going to say, you, are you seeing this part of the world becoming not only one of the benefits of that flight to safety is that it also then becomes the, the almost like a global connector to markets you know are the are the flows of cash and investment not just coming into the region but facilitating trade because I, I had a conversation with dr tani al ziudi um a few months ago he was very much saying the ue wants to be this global trade partner now it's not a regional play it's a global play because of the um strong, stable leadership that we have in this region. And because of the geopolitical tensions that are happening, you find that this area is becoming more consolidated and we are becoming more connected. As I said, we'll be supplying more gas and oil to the West, right? And the connectivity between the UAE and India and Indonesia and um, China, that's just going to strengthen over time. For example, Indonesia will be in the top seven economies by 2030. So, so the UAE is becoming an anchor point, is becoming a, a, a safe haven almost um, for investment flows. That's fascinating. I think Indonesia is one of the countries where the UAE is creating these. Well, we've got free trade agreements, but actually we've been quite aggressive with these common economic partnership agreements. I think India was another one. So again, is that more evidence for you that just where we're sat is one of the best places to be if you're in business if you want to do trade with the world we are the region now that's coming up that I, I, and what's your thought about this region being coming you know being preeminent in, in the next five years i mean most definitely just on a very anecdotal level in the last three months you know is this is not even my day job but i've introduced three private banking clients to our bank from the from asia you're you're seeing People coming here, they're moving family offices here. I think they are seeing the UAE as a diversification play. Uh, for example, I'm seeing more Chinese um, entrepreneurs, more Chinese um, high net worth individuals wanting to locate themselves here. But it's also having the other way, you know, from the UAE into a places like Singapore, for example. So I think that connectivity is really going to grow. Now, I stalked you on LinkedIn. Uh, before our, our conversation and I, I, I saw something that really gelled with me um, and it reminded me of a phrase um, that Winston Churchill once said about you know a leader seeing an opportunity in every difficulty and how important leadership is we've talked about you know leadership at the highest level here with the UEE and we also know that the leadership here is very focused on the prosperity and the well-being of its people um, and often they talk about that being you know one of the the, the single biggest and most important uh, driver of its future and its ability to you know to achieve its ambitions what's your personal view of leadership i you were asking me earlier what my role was right and what do i do i think my role is actually to stay out of the way <laughs> now i laugh but that is a very very good thing for a leader to do yeah because but explain more i i, I tell i tell the CEOs who report into me that at the end of the day is while from the org chart perspective they work for me, but in reality I work for them. My job is to help them become successful, and for me fundamentally the leader must add value to his or her followers. That is fundamental. If you don't add value to your followers, then you forfeit the right to lead. You might still hold the title. You might still hold the org organizational position but at the end of the day leadership is about followership and you won't get followership unless your followers feel that you are adding value to them you're reminding me a bit of ted lasso at the minute which is this uh, show which is all focused on a, a football coach and it's something that it, it strikes me that sometimes the world of sports has almost realized this for a long long time in that you need to get buy-in from the team and in fact it's the coach's job to enable the players on the field of play to score the goals. And, and then, if thus, if they win, the coach wins. Exactly. But the coach isn't on the... Co the coach can't score every goal. That's, in fact, micromanagement. So y your thoughts about that mentality, is it... I've, I've seen it called humble leadership, servant leadership. Where, do, where What's your definition of leadership? Um, my definition is that 
a leader is someone who helps his people become successful. That's number one. Number two, a leader is someone who builds successful teams. So my role is to bring them together into one ecosystem, into one team, uh, which brings the synergies out and brings network behavior between the various countries. That must be a challenging role as well, because uh, I, look, from my perspective, one of the mistakes we've made perhaps in the world of management is try to impose a one size fits all. And if you're bringing disparate cultures together, how do you get them to work on a, that common goal? Because each of them will have slightly different systems or slightly different cultures, slightly different working hours, time zones, uh, approaches to a tackling a problem. How do you get that commonality of going, this is the purpose, this is the goal? Actually, I have, t- I have to say I'm very fortunate. You know, I have an amazing bunch of CEOs who report into me. And every single one of them just wants to do better. Every single one of them wants to do great. So that makes it a lot more easier. That helps. Right? Yeah. That, that helps, right? One of the things that has been helpful for me is, is um, there's a heuristic I use, you know, which is based on Hofstadter's cultural dimensions. Essentially, Hofstadter was an was a academic who studied national cultures, and he came up with about six dimensions of different cultures, you know, from um, power distance to masculinity to uncertainty, avoidance to indulgence. Okay. You know, it's, 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 it's yeah. a stereotype. Yeah. Okay, it's a stereotype. But stereotypes have some truth in them. Absolutely. Um, we, if we carry on talking about people, and the reason why I keep talking about people is because we love this podcast. So actually, you know, when we said at the, the opening that looking at the world through a human lens, human capital, to me, it seems, is almost the foundation of sustainability for any company out there. The banking industry, uh, even more so, because it's all based on knowledge economy. Um How important is it for FAB to develop the next generation? If we're talking about Generation Z, we see them coming through. They're already kind of rewriting some of the rules around management and how we need to deal with them. If we look at the UEE, for example, you know, there is a big drive for emeritization. There is a big drive to empower the youth. So it goes on and kind of picks up the ball and carries on charging down the field. What's FAB's thought on that or approach to that? Oh, I think human capital development is just fundamental because what is banking? Banking is basically technology and people, right? The technology part is not easy, but it's doable. But it's the people part that that becomes very, very fundamental. And our group CEO has really put in a lot of effort uh, into ensuring that we build our people, we grow our people. So one thing I'm very proud of in the International Network is a program we just launched recently. We're going to send out 20 Emiratis into the International Network for short-term assignments of three to six months. Uh, and, and that is the first time we are doing this. We've already sent 10, and we're going to be sending another 10 for the rest of the year. High-performing, uh, high-potential Emirati colleagues so that they get the international exposure, they get to see a different dimension of the business and bring that knowledge back into the country. One of the things, and I've got to ask you this question because I was uh, recently talking to the uh, the head of strategy for PwC, a guy called Blair Shepard, super smart. Uh, he wrote this book called um, Ten Years to Midnight, which basically is kind of, you know, he looks at AI, the impact of all of that on the world. He writes that globalization is no longer fit for purpose. Again, with your perspective. Does globalization still work, particularly from a banking industry? Are the flows of money around the world still working as they should? What's your thought if I say globalization fit for purpose or needs an, needs an update? Yeah, I think globalization has hit a pretty serious speed bump, right? What you're finding is a beginning of a fragmentation of some sort. Um, for example, you know, more and more governments are introducing subsidies, which therefore will disrupt supply chains and bring supply chains back into the country. Um, because of national security reasons, some governments are beginning to impose stronger restrictions on, on investment flows, and they're beginning, like the US, beginning to ex, uh, restrict export flows. Yeah. So this is fragmenting what has been an um, integrated global order. Right? What I think will happen is that we will get more fragmentation, but that doesn't mean there won't be interconnectivity. I think interconnectivity will grow. I think they will grow, but probably not in a 
in a globalized way, but probably more within regions, within countries. So, for example, the UAE establishing stronger connectivity with India, establishing stronger connectivity with China, with Indonesia, and 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 the Asian region. That is one example of where I think it'll be a lot more bilateral. Yes. Oh well, again, we go back to the UAE striking all of these common economic partnership agreements. I think food security was one of those uh, it was high on their list. You've seen that as well, I think, through y- your lens of food security. Yes, think, definitely. Yeah. So Brazil is one of our key markets. A lot of our meat comes from there. And recently, you've had Salik, uh, um, Saudi sovereign wealth fund invest about thirty plus percent in Olam in in Singapore, which is a commodities company here. How's your diary these days? Is it getting busier and busier? I mean, again, when we do go back to the day-to-day of a, you know, a head of international banking group, what's keeping you busy apart from, I know you said trying to keep out of your way of your CEOs. I'm sure you do actually do some things. So give us an idea of really what's your focus? What are the, the, the five things and on so, your desk right yeah. now that you're most excited about? You know, when I first took over the role, it was about fixing some things. Right, and I th- I'm really happy to say that we are now in a space where most of our countries are in good space and we're chugging along. Um, so I'm looking at what we are now working through our international strategy. So we've gone through and developed each of the country's strategies. We are now sharpening it. So that's something that I'm really, really focused about. I'm really focused about strengthening the first-line risk culture in, in international because it's just fundamental. You know, risk doesn't sit with the chief risk officer. It doesn't sit with the chief credit. It actually sits with the business. Yes. And getting that right is important. So, so that's good. democratizing. That's that right. Way. That's okay. right. Um, I like that, democratizing risk. Democratizing risk. So it's yes. everybody's fault. Right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> but, you know, but, it, but it's... I yeah. guess that then means you have to enable a culture where there can be feedback and actually someone further down the chain has is empowered to speak out and go, actually, because a lot of these financial crises that we've seen previously, if it was often CD leaderships had listened, you know, and there'd been that communication flow within the business, perhaps they could have been avoided. Um, does that, again, come back to being the leader, the leader that's there for his people, the leader that's there, basically, I work for you. Does that enable that flow of communication? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. I think there are two things. One is... It's about risk education. Mm. I think people need to understand how to see risk and how to view risk, you know. The second one is then the freedom to actually um, um, speak up and, and yeah. say, look, I see this, I'm worried about this. I think that's the third one. And the third piece then is that the freedom to make a mistake and, and to know, you know, you're not going to get hung out to dry because we make mistakes. Yes. And the question is, how do we learn from this mistake? No, totally. Um, I mean, I was interested as well because, again, we, t- we said at the top of the podcast that you actually took this job on. Um, 2021? Yeah, March 21. Yeah. That's kind of like just as the world's coming out of the pandemic. You know, there was we were still we were still in it. Um, I mean, I think anyone that was in the UEE recognised that the way this country, you know, adapted uh, and handled the pandemic and COVID, it was like second to none. But what was the op- what's the opportunity you've seen this region create for itself? during you know through its handling of the pandemic and then since uh particularly and again you said you know you'd introduced private clients just very recently i think we had so many high net worth individuals that during the pandemic came to this region came to the ue looked around and went no i'm moving here yeah actually i read, read something that said that dubai created probably four thousand millionaires last year again what's the secret of that success then what's the secret source maybe we I, shouldn't I, be I think telling the in that sense this. you know covid management worked well for this country because it it demonstrated an incredible level of credibility and you know what was also interesting is that the way dubai did it and the way abu dhabi did it were completely different yeah. right but the ability to manage that diversity within this system and and do it well i think spoke volumes about the credibility and the the strength of the leadership in this country well, I've just finished watching a documentary called This England, which was all about its handling of the pandemic. I'm very glad I was here. Um, oof, I could, there's so many things we could talk about all day, but you've been super generous with your time. The one thing we always kind of end the show on is a predictions round. So give me three predictions. You know, what you think is going to be happening out from an economic point of view? What's the opportunity? What's exciting you moving forward? Three predictions as to what we can see 2023, 2024. Are we going to beat inflation? Do we need to worry about it in this part of the world? I think inflation will continue to be an issue. You know, I think 
on the one hand, what you're seeing is that you're seeing some level of slowdown. I think the IMF has reduced global GDP forecast by about 1% now. So in that sense, that's a good news, right? It sounds like, okay, maybe we will have a soft landing. But the problem is that in most developed economies, wage inflation isn't coming under control. So that, that's a concern. So I think inflation will still continue. I, I think there'll still be a couple of rate hikes, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Now, whether we will have a recession, full-blown recession, I think generally people are thinking not, but who knows, right? That's one. I think geopolitical tensions will continue. I think the whole um, decoupling between China and America will, will, will continue, especially since we are coming into election season in the US, the presidential election season. And I, it, it's, it's massive, right? Because China and the US together do 25% of global trade. So this decoupling will have massive effect on the, on the global economy. However, on the other hand, it will then create more opportunities for regionalization which is what we're seeing here. We're seeing a consolidation in the region, and I think that would be good for this economy. Someone um, described the UE, and, and this part of the world in particular, the Gulf, as the new Switzerland. What's your take on that? In that it's got that opportunity to be the place where everybody can still come and do business. I think so. I think the UAE is, 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 is a great place to be in. And also we are putting in policies, for example, the golden visa, which is enabling people to lengthen the l amount of time they can spend here. Uh, it's, it's becoming a very, very attractive place. Clarence, thank you very much for joining us on Thought Creators today. If you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have, you know what to do. Please hit subscribe or remember you can find us and follow us on all the podcast platforms of your choice. Uh, once again, Clarence, Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Scott. It was, well, I had a great time. Thought Creators, the podcast for financial experts brought to you by FAB.